story of how God was seeking a bride for his son. Each book is different from every other book. I'm trying to give you the keys for you to unlock it for yourself. The book of Daniel is a mixture of the best known and the least known parts of Scripture, I think. Everybody knows about the lion's den. Uh, most people know about the fiery furnace with Shadrach, Meshach and into Bejigo or something. And uh, then everybody seems to know about Belshazzar's feast, which was the origin of our phrase, the writing on the wall, meaning the judgment that's coming. It's also very easy to understand and very difficult to understand. There are parts of Daniel that are so straightforward, you need no help from me to read them and get the message. There are other parts that are so obscure that uh, people have wrestled with them for years. There's the question of Daniel's 70 weeks. And that's been a happy hunting ground for <laughs> prophetic students for a long time. There's a lot of the book that is natural and therefore easy to understand. For example, that uh, Daniel was healthier when he kept off red meat and stuck to vegetables and fruit. That's a perfectly natural thing which has become very popular today. There are also a lot of supernatural things that people find very difficult to accept, like the fact that the three men cast into a fiery furnace, heated seven times hotter than usual, and their hair wasn't even singed. And unbelievers say, do you expect me to accept that? A lot of it is familiar to us, displaced persons far from home. I'm afraid that's only too familiar in our modern world. Refugees. But there's a lot that's unfamiliar to us. And Daniel does pose the question, what is the Bible? Is it a human book or a divine book? Same old issue is there. Now, it's written by humans, about humans, as I've said, and therefore many simply treat the Bible as they treat any other books in any other category, as history or literature or religion. But you really can't treat the Bible like that because it's also a divine book. It's written by God and about God as well, or at least it's inspired by God, even if men wrote it. And therefore, things that are impossible to men but are possible to God figure in so many books of the Bible that you're faced with this whole question. Because only God can do certain things and only God can say certain things, assuming there is a God. Only God can do miracles. Only God can suspend natural laws or interfere with natural processes or intervene in the overriding laws of cause and effect which govern most events on our earth. Or to put it in a word, only God can do signs and wonders, which is a phrase that comes in this book of Daniel specifically. A wonder, the word comes from a Latin word which means something that's wonderful, something that's amazing. Mirus is the Latin word and that has produced our word miracle, something beyond our comprehension, something amazing. The other thing is that God can only say certain things and in particular God can only say things about the future with any authority. Anything man says is a guesstimate. He is speculating but only God can tell us what's going to happen. And the book of Daniel covers 75 years of Daniel's life but it covers 440 years of history and not past history but future history. In fact, as we get into it, we'll realize that he covers at least 2,400 years of history and sees into the distant future with remarkable accuracy. And that again has puzzled liberal scholars who really can't cope with that. Now, there's been a sea change in people's attitude to miracles and prophecies. They used to be considered as proofs of the inspiration of the Bible. And many apologists for the Christian faith used to say, well, 
look at the miracles in the Bible and look at the uh, prophecies in the Bible, that's proof that the Bible comes from God. Nowadays, both miracles and prophecies are considered a handicap to proving the truth of the Bible. And it's come to just the opposite. And people say, well, if you'd cut out the miracles and cut out the prophecies, I could really believe the Bible. And instead of helping people to believe it's God's book, it now hinders people in believing it's God's book. That's because we now live in a scientific age. So how do scientific-minded people deal with the miracles and prophecies? Well, the miracles, they treat them as fiction rather than fact, as myths and legends. They may have some historical truth in them, but really should be treated as sagas and uh, not as historical truth. So Daniel in the lion's den is explained away as either the lions had just been fed or that they didn't eat Daniel because most of him was backbone and the rest was grit. In other words, these stories have no historical value but have genuine spiritual and moral value. They put... Daniel's backbone into you by reading the story. A kind of Aesop's fables or Struel Peter. That's how many people treat the miracles of the Bible today as tales with a moral. And they treat the prophecies as record written afterwards rather than revelation written beforehand. And you'll find many Bible commentaries by modern liberal scholars taking the predictions about the future and saying, well, of course, these belong to much later. They've been put back into the book of Daniel after the event. And as we shall see, chapter 11 of Daniel is the most incredible account of a series of events which took place centuries after Daniel. And I'm going to give you a sheet of secular history historical record of what happened centuries later so that you can read it alongside Daniel 11. There are about 200 specific details in Daniel 11, every one of which happened centuries later. And statistically, the coincidence is incredible. It must either have been written by man afterwards or it was inspired by God beforehand. You've got to make a choice. Now, the many people who want to treat the miracles and prophecies in this humanistic way, funnily enough, many of them want to keep the Bible. I don't know why, I wish they'd be honest and throw the whole lot away, but why do they want to keep it? Well, they say you can keep it for its moral and spiritual values. It's a good book. Cut out the miraculous, but keep the moral part of it, and we'd all be much better off. In other words, live by the Ten Commandments or the Sermon on the Mount, but forget the miracles and forget the prophecies. No, an, awful, an awful lot of people think that, that way. Or, unfortunately, many today dismiss the Bible as misleading and irrelevant. That historically it's a book of lies and you mustn't uh, therefore be taken in by it. So we get this very ambivalent attitude. Do you know why people are unwilling to accept the miraculous and the prophetic because they are unwilling to accept God. I really believe that's the basic reason. They don't want the supernatural side of Scripture because if they believed it, then they would have to live differently. God is only too real and they would have to come to terms with that and relate to him. It's interesting, you know, the evidence for the resurrection is so strong as I've said in my little book on the resurrection, it's so strong that any jury in any court would be totally convinced that it had happened as an event. The events of the eyewitness, the evidence of the eyewitness testimony plus the circumstantial evidence that points to it is so strong. It's about 200 times stronger than for the fact that Julius Caesar invaded England in 55 BC. And yet I've never met anybody who questions that Julius Caesar invaded England. They all accept that on far less evidence. Why? Well, because if Jesus rose from the dead, they've got to change their lives. His claims for himself must be true and therefore his claims on us must also be valid. 
and you can't ignore Jesus. You can ignore Julius Caesar. You can believe in him without doing anything, but you can't believe in Jesus Christ without changing your whole way of life. There's a built-in reluctance to accept the supernatural dimension of Scripture. It's not just a scientism that believes that we live in a closed universe and that there is no reality other than can be put in a test tube or investigated with instruments. It is largely due to man's reluctance to face the supernatural. Now then, Daniel. Daniel's book, the first thing that strikes you is that it's in two halves and that the first half is all miracle and the second half is all prophecy. So we've got a problem. And those who have difficulty with the supernatural really don't know what to do with the book of Daniel. It is the worst book for them in the Bible so that we have chapters 1 to 6 which are very, very easy to understand and easy to teach in Sunday school and that's why we know the first six chapters backwards and we've heard the stories ever since we were so high and why the second half is so difficult and one that we don't know so well and is very puzzling when we read it. So let's just, uh, I should have done this in a chart but let's do it mentally and you can write it down. Chapters 1 to 6 chapter 7 to 12. Let's draw a contrast. Chapters 1 to 6 is mainly miracles. Chapter 7 to 12 is mainly prophecies. Chapters 1 to 6, the first half is written in the third person, Daniel, he. Chapters 7 to 12 are all written in the first person, I, written by Daniel himself. So the first half is about him, and the second half is by him. The first half is what happened during Daniel's life. The second half is what happen, will happen after Daniel's life. And some of it has happened and some of it is yet to happen, but it's all future. So first half is present, second half is future. The most unusual difference between the two, now you'll have to listen carefully to this, you see, we've got two equal halves of six chapters each. In the first six, the first chapter is in Hebrew and the next five are in Aramaic, which is the official lingua franca of the time. It was a language that was used everywhere in the ancient world. In the second half, the first chapter is in Aramaic and the other five are in Hebrew again. How do you follow that? It's interesting, it tells you where the chapters were meant to be read, who they were directed towards. So that uh, first chapter is Hebrew, then the next five are Aramaic, then in the second half the first is Aramaic and the rest are in Hebrew. So you can tell which parts were meant to be read widely by unbelievers and which were meant for the people of God to understand. Follow? But it's not just two equal halves, it's more complex than that. Now let's look at the historical background. Put those back up in a moment. Now I'm leaving them in the way. Let's look at the historical background for a moment. Babylon and back. It's very important to realize that the children of Israel weren't all taken into exile together and they weren't brought back together. That's an oversimplification. When you read the records carefully, they were taken to Babylon in three lots and they came back in three lots, but actually the total number who came back was very, very much smaller than the total who went. And in fact, they left behind them in Babylon a whole Jewish community which was there until only a few years ago. So that uh, they didn't all come back not by a long way. And the wise men who followed the star to Bethlehem almost certainly came from the Jewish community that had been left behind, who were looking for the sign of the King of the Jews. So they were not probably Gentiles as the usual Christmas story makes out. They probably came from Babylon, from the Jewish community. That's just an aside. Now the three deportations. You remember the first in 606 was the top layer of society, the key people, 
and uh, among them they took the young people, particularly the youth, and among them were four young men, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, outstanding young men who were being groomed for the Jewish royal house. And those four men are the heroes in our book. So Daniel went with the first lot among those young people. The second deportation in 597 took Ezekiel. So he followed Daniel. He was a bit younger than Daniel. He followed him. And the rest were all taken in 586. And that's when the city and the temple were destroyed. Now, you don't need to remember all this, but it's just we tend to get the impression that all the nation went into exile and all the nation came back, don't we? And that's not actually the case. But Daniel was one of the first and he never came back, never saw his land again and he was only a teenager when he went. When they came back later, the book of Daniel is set against the background of going to Babylon and coming back from Babylon. It's all there. Daniel never came back. He stayed and he died there. He could have come back in any of the three returns but he didn't. The first return was in 536 under Zerubbabel and it was made possible because Babylon was defeated by the Persians in 539. And Cyrus, the ruler of the Persians, allowed that return and some 50,000 came back in the first wave. The first aliyah, as they call it, that is a Hebrew word for going up to Jerusalem. They still talk about making your aliyah. And the first Aliyah, 10, 50,000, was under Zerubbabel. The second came a few years later under Ezra in 458. And uh, the temple had begun to be rebuilt in 516, but it languished for a long time. And finally, the, the last great wave of Aliyah from Babylon was 445 or 444, it's a little difficult working out the calendar, under Nehemiah and that's when the city walls were rebuilt and the city of God made secure from its enemies around. The other one thing I want to point out on this historical background, it's Esther comes in here and she was in Susa which was the capital of the Medo-Persians and we're going to study her next. We're concerned at the moment with Daniel who lived through all this, was taken there in the first deportation and stayed even after the last return. He had a long lifespan and interesting enough he was popular under various successive conquerors. They all recognised Daniel's quality and as each empire was defeated by someone else they kept Daniel on because he was such a good guy. It's an amazing uh, career and the quality of the man just shines through. So that's the historical background. The main emperor of Babylon of course who did, did all this was Nebuchadnezzar and if you've ever seen the operetta Nabucco, have you? That's a magnificent portrayal of uh, these events in Babylon. Right, that gives you the historical background. Now Daniel's life which is covered by chapters 1 to 6 of his book. Chapter 1 is about his deportation in 605, 606 and his selection for the royal court of Babylon. It's very interesting that he was given a Babylonian name after a Babylonian god. He was called Belteshazzar and so were his three companions and they didn't object to that. I find that interesting. They're quite happy to be called anything they liked but they remained faithful to their God and the crisis arose because they were being fed to be nice and fat and that was considered good in that court as it is today in Tonga. If you've ever seen the royal family of Tonga you know that certain royal courts consider that a sign of prosperity and so they were being fattened up for senior positions and Daniel and his three friends did not accept that. And the man in charge of their training at the University of Babylon, they were being given all the wisdom of Babylon, they were being 
given every educational advantage. He said, look, the, the emperor will have my head off if I don't fatten you up properly. And Daniel made a bargain with that man. He said, look, we'll go on diet for ten days and we'll eat what God tells us and then you can compare us with the other students. And if we are not fitter and healthier, then we'll go on to your diet. Very interesting how Daniel began his stand for principle in a very small matter of diet. That's the Daniel who could face the lions later and, and there's a profound lesson here that if you can stand your ground over a little issue, you're likely to stand your ground over a big issue. I once said to a saint of God, I'm not sure that I would go to the lions for Jesus if it really came to the push. I, I don't know if I've got martyr stuff in me. And he, I'll never forget what he said. He said, David, if you're faithful in little things, God will give you grace when the big test comes and you'll be all right. And here's the profound lesson. You form your character in small decisions on little issues and that enables you later when the big crunch comes not to shift. It's people who are shifty on little things who fall when the big test of character comes. This is the kind of lesson you can learn from Daniel. And there were ten, they were not only better in health, it says they were ten times better in their studies than the other students. I would to God that every Christian student in university was like that. See? Sometimes too busy in the Christian union. But if they're in the will of God in being at university, then the best thing they can do for the Lord is to be good at their studies and be better than everybody else at their studies. Do you see? That's Daniel. This is a, a young man with real character and he's laying a foundation for a lifetime of service outside the people of God. He's going to be in what some would call a secular job. Actually, there's no job secular to a, a a person who belongs to God. Everything is a sacred vocation. That's chapter 1. Chapter 2 begins the rather mysterious part of uh, the book with a dream of a monster and that's the only part in, chapter, in the first six chapters that puzzles people <laughs> because it begins the apocalyptic part, the visionary, the symbolic part. Nebuchadnezzar has a dream and he sends for all his wise men and he says, I want you to, t you to tell me the meaning of the dream but I've forgotten the dream. <laughs> and he says, off with your heads if you don't tell me not only the meaning of the dream but what the dream was all about because I've forgotten it. Now <laughs> there's a real test, isn't there? And Daniel and his three young men could not only interpret the dream, they could recount it. And they told him what he dreamt. Yeah, that's what I dreamt. <coughs> And they told him the meaning too. Wisdom from God was needed because how do you know what another guy's dreamt about when he can't remember? But God knew. God knows everything. And the dream was of a monster, a giant. And uh, as you go down the giant, so the quality of the material declines from gold to silver to <coughs> iron to feet of clay. Have you heard that phrase? feet of clay or feet of iron mixed with clay and the interpretation of the dream is that this golden head is Nebuchadnezzar but this whole figure is an unveiling, an apocalyptic unveiling of future empires that will replace Babylon. Babylon will be replaced by the Medes and the Persians under Cyrus and Darius and that happened, but they were not the same grandeur or glory as Babylon. Nothing has touched Babylon since for sheer magnificence. They would be followed by the Greek, the Greek Empire under Alexander the Great who would obliterate the Persians and the Medes. Alexander the Great got as far as India. He built his capital Persopolis right where the Medo-Persians had been. The ruins of it you can see today. And the Greeks would be replaced with the Romans, legs of iron, and really what a symbol of Rome that is. 
It was their armies that established Roman law and order. They would be followed by feet of mixed clay and iron. Now I'll come back to all this later because we've got somehow to fit all this in. And then he saw a stone taken from a mountain, a stone that was not shaped by man. No, I'm rushing ahead to chapter 7. I think I'll leave it till chapter 7. That was the dream and the interpretation. It's the only part of the first six chapters that is a bit puzzling. It was God's first warning to Nebuchadnezzar, I'm in charge of kingdoms. The whole of Daniel is saying it is God who causes kingdoms to rise and to fall. <coughs> kingdoms come and kingdoms go, but it's God who decides when they come and when they go. And history is his story. And God is saying, I will bring these other empires after you. They won't have your magnificence. They will gradually become weaker, humanly speaking, but it's I who do it. In other words, God is saying, mine is the kingdom, not yours. Chapter 3 is the famous story of the fiery furnace. Nebuchadnezzar, probably because of this dream, ordered a gigantic statue to be erected 90 feet high and 9 feet wide and covered in gold. Now when you know that the land of Mesopotamia is as flat as a pancake as far as the eye can see, a statue 90 feet high is pretty impressive. It would dominate the landscape. And uh, he made an order that uh, whenever the band played, everybody had to bow down to this idol. It was a kind of established state religion and it was a quick way of uniting the empire around one religion. And Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego refused to. I've always wondered where was Daniel right now? Why didn't he get caught up in this? But they refused to bow down and uh, Nebuchadnezzar didn't notice but I'm afraid somebody told tales on them. And you know the story, they were thrown into the fiery furnace which was heated seven times more than usual. And when Nebuchadnezzar, by the way, the, the people who heated it up and threw them in, they got burned up, it was so hot. But when Nebuchadnezzar peered in through the open mouth of the furnace, he saw four people in there. And he said, one is like a son of the gods. That's a literal translation. That's as far as he could interpret it. One is like a son of the gods. And actually the fire burned the ropes off them but didn't singe their hair. You can believe it if God is real. You couldn't believe it if you don't believe in God, I don't think. But anti-Semitism became a feature of the Babylonian Empire and it's been the curse all around the world ever since. Chapter 4 is my favourite story in the Old Testament. That must mean I'm a bit perverted but uh, it's about Nebuchadnezzar's madness and uh, he calls it a sign and wonder and he, through it he was converted to the God of Israel. It's an amazing story. I'll just give you the background to give you a bit of human interest. He married a queen, a very beautiful princess, from up in the mountains of Persia where Tehran now is and Tehran is surrounded by forests and mountains and when she came to the palace of Nebuchadnezzar she was terribly homesick. I mean she missed the mountains, she missed the trees and she missed the wild animals and she kept crying herself to sleep at night and he said, what's the matter? She said, I'm homesick. Well what have you not got here that you had back home? Well we had mountains and trees and wild animals and he said, right we'll soon sort that out. He said, I'll build you a mountain here and he built a mountain of brick, a huge mountain of brick and then he covered it with trees and shrubs and plants. It became one of the seven wonders of the world. Tourists flocked to see the hanging gardens of Babylon and then on the top he put a zoo, a private zoo and cages with wild animals in. Right, he said, no more crying in the palace. You've got a mountain, you've got a forest, you've got animals. What more do you want? Stop crying. So that was basically the human situation behind this story. And then one day he's on the roof of his magnificent palace. Oh, I better show you what Babylon looked like in those days. I mean, it really was an enormous city. There it is stretching as far as the eye can see. 
and here is the royal compound and then there was a main thoroughfare, there's Nebuchadnezzar in his chariot with his soldiers marching in through a very famous gate called the Ishtar Gate. Ishtar, Ashtati, the goddess, it's all there. And that Ishtar Gate, well, you better, you better see it. I mean, it was magnificent, blue glazed tiles, that is the actual gate rebuilt in a museum. And. Uh, it, enormous gate, and in these glazed tiles are these griffins and weird and wonderful animals, and I'm sure they lie behind Daniel's visions of animals, as we shall see later, all kinds of animals. By the way, that is the rebuilt arch in Babylon, rebuilt by Saddam Hussein, half size. <coughs> so you can tell, that's the size of people today, that's the new arch that Saddam Hussein has built, but it's half the height of that. So that's Babylon. And uh, the king was walking on the roof of his palace and he said, is not this great Babylon which I have built by my power for my glory? Mine is the kingdom, the power and the glory. And uh, that's when he had a dream. The dream was of a huge tree that reached the sky and the animals found shelter under it, the birds in, it, in its branches, and the tree was cut down and bound in iron and then it began to grow again. And Daniel told him the dream, Nebuchadnezzar, that's you, that tree, and you're going to be driven out from among men for seven years until you acknowledge that the Most High rules in the kingdoms of men and gives them to anyone he wishes. And you know, he forgot all about that. One year later, God spoke and said, Nebuchadnezzar, what I told you is going to happen now. And he went absolutely crazy for seven years. They had to lock him up in his own zoo and he ate grass for seven years and his hair grew like the feathers of an eagle and his nails like the claws of a bird. Uh, just like Howard Hughes in his last days, if you saw pictures of that man. And that's what happened to Nebuchadnezzar. At the end of seven years, he lifted his eyes to heaven and he said, God, you're God. And God restored him to his throne, <laughs> made him greater than before. And then he made a big mistake. He decided to establish the God of Israel, told everybody they had to bow down to him <laughs> and forced everybody to <laughs> worship this God. You don't get worshipped that way, but nevertheless, that was his conversion. And forever afterwards, he worshipped the God of Israel, who had driven him mad. He said, God had to make me mad for seven years before I came to my senses. It's a hard way to get converted, but what a story. What a story. Great Babylon. And young Daniel there, you can see him living in that palace compound, can't you? Chapter 5 is the story of the end of Babylon. Belshazzar has a big feast and he makes a big mistake. He says, I know, he said, he wanted to profane holy things. Do you remember that in Leviticus? So he said, let's get the holy vessels that we brought from the temple in Jerusalem and let's use them for an orgy. And that's what he did. They were getting drunk out of the holy vessels from the temple in Jerusalem and he saw a finger writing on a wall. Many, many tackle up Hassim. You know, what does that mean? When they saw this disembodied finger writing this, they were scared stiff. And Daniel said, That means you are weighed in the balances and you are found wanting. That very night, the Persians got into Babylon. And Babylon was finished. You realize that Babylon was the Tower of Babel? That's where Babel was, same word. It's where they built the Tower of Babel. They were always building big things up to the sky because it was so flat. Big things reaching up to the heaven were so impressive. Babel, Babylon. Well, Babylon pops up again in the last book in the Bible, as you know. Chapter 6, of course, is Daniel in the lion's den. We're now under another king, another empire, another emperor. We're under Darius. And now, once again, there are problems. There's anti-Semitism. Once again, people are forced to worship the God the Emperor wants them to 
and people are forbidden to pray to any other god for a period of a month. But Daniel's not going to be deterred. And he always had a habit of praying towards Jerusalem uh, with an open window, looking far to the west to where God's dwelling place had been. And he went up to his bedroom window as usual. You know the rest of the story. And it says, an angel shut the lion's mouths. Takes an angel to hold a lion's mouth shut. And he was delivered again. And Darius had to swallow his words. Daniel just went on and on and on, no matter who came or conquered. Daniel was a man whose quality and whose integrity everybody recognized and therefore wanted to make responsible and give high office to. It's a, a wonderful model and example for young men to be the kind of young men whom unbelievers, pagans, will use because they recognize integrity and quality of character. Well, that's just the first six chapters and we'll make a break there. <laughs>